Hey, hey, it's Kurt the Arborist, Arborist Blueprint Podcast. Welcome back, if you're not a new person. Uh, today we have Rebecca Siebel. Hopefully you've heard of her, you know her. She's uh, from the US of A, whereas I'm from Canada. And she's a arborist trainer, a big advocate for women tree climbing uh, or women in Abora culture. She runs a bunch of women tree climbing competitions and she has her own company, Tree Spirit Consulting which we're going to get into. She also has a, a bit of a YouTube channel around that as well. So she's big into training. She's big into supporting women in a Bora culture. And uh, she's got lots of cool ideas. And I want to learn more about her. So let's let her in. Hey, hey. there you, you are. How you doing? Not too bad. Just came in from outside. Hopefully I'll be respectably presentable here. How are yeah, you? Yeah, I look great. You look great. Uh, doing good. Yeah, good to see you. It's been a Likewise. while since we since we chatted, hey? Yeah. Yeah. How are things going? I'd say things are going well. Uh, yeah? It's So I live in the Driftless region of Wisconsin, and uh, it's gorgeous here right now, time of year. So like how, how warm? Well, it's the, <clears throat> it's the mid seventies, eighties, uh, Fahrenheit. And it's just, it's harvest time. You know, the whole season oh, yeah. is behind you. Things are beautiful and starting to get the cool nights, which I love. So it's hard to be nice, hard to be anything but grateful at this time of year. Yeah. And you got a little place there, like with some land or a uh, garden or yard or something a little bit yeah we've got about just under nine acres here so I'm, oh wow i'm super lucky to have uh some great woods in the back so that's great as, that's my dream yeah it, it, yeah it's a it's a good safe place for any arborist to go and and just rejuvenate um and i'm fortunate enough that some trees have come down in storms and so i don't have to feel bad so bad about taking them down uh but it's opening up some pasture where i hope to have my maybe get my horses here so oh, okay yeah, yeah one of those things that's great yeah i did a I did a quick intro of uh you like super quick you know okay. i said you had a, U, a youtube channel tree yep. spirit consulting uh your website tree spirit consulting.com people can have a look there and i was just bumping around on there before uh we we met up today so I was hoping you could give us a little background on kind of mm -hmm. what you do, like who you are in the arboriculture industry and kind of why. We'll we'll get into the why maybe as we get going, but right. yeah. Cool. Well, uh, Tree Spirit Consulting is a business I've had uh, my own. I can do tree work. I do traveling, training. <clears throat> I've had that for about five years on my own, but I haven't really focused on it, so... The website, please be patient, is still a work in progress. <laughs> no problem. Uh, I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, list the top 10 things you want to do, and working on the website's not one of them. But Yeah, not uh, usually. So, work in progress. Um, <clears throat> so, I am right now in, uh, in a space where I'm focusing more on that, but also deciding what the last, say, 10 or 15 years of my professional career is going to look like which is, you know, a, a, a little bit of a, wow, what an opportunity and, you know, wow, what a, you know, what a daunting task. So <clears throat> I've been, uh, I've been working on my own training, um, developing curriculum for the courses that I've been teaching, um, a lot of chainsaw safety classes, a lot of um, climbing, still doing my work with the Women's Tree Climbing Workshop, um, where we have <clears throat> three, two and a half day retreats to new to intermediate climbers, some advanced climbers, and that's really a special, special thing that I'm still being able to participate in. Um, but looking for, looking for the next uh, opportunity, I guess, still. Okay. So, Gathering, um, gathering my resources and still working on my personal projects, which once, you know, once you've been in the industry for a while, you have a pretty good bead on 
what tree climbers are like and yeah what tree climbers aren't like <laughs> so you mean encompassing some personal things into a boar culture and how you're going to tie that all together for the next 10 15 years yeah absolutely so you mean like like something that's going to serve your passion and your yeah. your vision bring everything together so yeah. you feel like it's it's all just tied yeah i totally know where you're at and, and how you're feeling yeah. Yeah. and i'm working on that a lot too yeah. um so just to recap because maybe we didn't we didn't cover it there but you are a trainer or you you were a trainer maybe associated with another company down there but oh. are you doing training independently now Right. Yes. So uh, I most recently was director of training for North American Training Solutions. Okay. And uh, that company has run into some bumps, big bumps in the road, we'll just say. And okay. so my whole department was eliminated uh, to mm. save costs. Okay. Which was, <clears throat> you know, which was a real surprise and was a, a kick in the pants for the for my whole team uh, and, you know, another whole department. Um, and there's a lot of talent that was just, uh, you know, kind of dumped, dumped off on the side of the road. Um, and so that has been a, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a hard adjustment. Um, right. Were you re relying on a lot of that training as far as like income or was it filling up a lot of your schedule? Well, I was doing, you know, full time and, and developing the curriculum for basically you're like writing a college program for what, oh, what it's like gotcha. to take someone. Uh, and, and I still am very passionate about that work, which I've continued to do on my own. Okay. And in fact, I've been doing that work, I think, since about 2003 when I, when I owned my own company because, like I said earlier, there's a... The, you know, how, how do you make someone do something right or wrong? Um, you can, you can, you know, get a bigger hammer or you can take care of the mm -hmm. whole person. Um, and certainly throughout my career, I've done <clears throat> training, um, almost by default because I was crew leader and owner of the company. And then, you know, you want to develop your own employees and it's easier to create a good employee in a lot of ways, take someone from green Mm -hmm. you know, zero to 18 months. And um, so I have a lot of passion surrounding that. And so I've continued to do that on my own um, and then continue to do that with Women's Street Climbing Workshop. And then, um, yes, also do the traveling training, municipalities, um, private tree care companies, a uh, lot of volunteer groups, you know, especially for chainsaw safety because that's, uh, you get people restoring a prairies, landowners things like that um, yeah that's a big common kind of repeat almost subscription type course right everyone's on that entry level of just yeah. using that chainsaw whether it's they go into a bar culture or not so there's a lot of probably yeah classes to teach there yeah and so, are you doing that all through your own company then tree spirit consulting right right all through tree spirit consulting oh uh, beauty okay yeah and then and, and then with the women's tree climbing workshop i've been friends with with melissa lavangi ingersoll and bear lavangi <laughs> for about well, a long time, about 20 years, <laughs> 25 years, maybe. And I love working the, with those two and, and what they've <clears throat> what they've developed for specifically for women, uh, because there was none, a safe place in order to learn arboriculture um, from women who are doing it. Right. And, a little bit more of a, like welcoming environment, like a little less competitive or intimidating. Is that, would that be the right way to kind of describe it or? Yes. Like, it, so... it, it's difficult to describe, I think, and it's difficult to describe for men the same way it's difficult to, to describe what it's like to be a man to a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, cer certainly there's biases uh, for a, a one woman who's in a company and trying to do the same thing as men. Uh, certainly women have different physical attributes and strengths. Um, and so the Women's Tree Climbing Workshop is, is, an, is just that. It's an environment where women can be empowered. It's safe. It's taught by women, which is one of the most important things is you just get to see someone else who looks like you, who's in the body that you're in, uh, who's doing the things. 
and enjoying yeah. it and capable and competent and has skills and is making money doing it. Um, right. And, and that's just, and the other thing with the women's tree, tree climbing workshop is uh, there's great sponsors for the, for the workshop over the last, I think it's going on year 12 now, somewhere in there, uh, that you can try a Kinesi harness and you don't have to put down the money. You can climb in it for, you know, a whole day. You can try out um, some, you can, you can try out a, a new rope and not have to shell out the money for it until you know you like it. New right. equipment. So Get that's a great wet a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I kind of wanted to give you, if you're willing to go down that road a little bit, yeah. a bit of the platform from your perspective. Um, yeah. Obviously being yeah. an advocate for women in the industry, and I'm sure this speaks to many other industries that are male dominated, um, you know, right or wrong, or whatever. Like, how, how could you kind of offer that perspective? Because I'm sure, you know, being in an arborist podcast, there's probably male dominant audience out there, right? And I would think like anything else, a lot of these challenges um, or miscommunications or whatever, you know, negative experiences that may or may not be happening, I don't know, could be as a result of just lack of understanding. It's possible or it may start there. But like, can you yeah. allude to, to some of that? Like just. Sure. Like we why do you think it's important, important to do all that? Um. <laughs> Let me start off by saying, I don't think that tree work is for everyone. So yeah, I agree. Men, I don't men, even know what's for me anymore. <laughs> men and women, it's a, you know, it's hot, it's cold, it's dirty, it's sweaty. You're in the rain. It's mm -hmm. unpleasant. The jobs don't often go the way you think they would. Uh, and one of the, the really only, only important thing to know about me as a, as a trainer when I show up is I want everyone to know what it's like to work on a safe, fun, competent crew. So for me, if you're working in a safe manner or as safe as possible and you've got competency and skills, usually you, you can have some fun. Mm -hmm. And an important thing about that statement is it doesn't mean that it's got to be all men or all women or no women allowed or or you know anything like that yeah. uh, and so I, I feel strongly that in in our industry if there is a woman who's willing to learn the skills who's willing to show up and have fun and be part of a good team and can work in the heat and can work in the cold and is gonna you know grease the chipper and do all the things uh, you're supposed we, to be research chipper. You're supposed to. Shoot. More on that later. <laughs> Just kidding. Although, I, okay, as an aside, they don't call them nipples anymore, right? They're called zerks. Zerks, yes. Zer which is German for nipple, I think. Which is hilarious. But anyway, I was forgetting one. On my, I didn't realize there was like six. I had to. I was just doing five all the time. Yeah, yeah, not good. Sorry, anyways. Okay, continue that's on. A, I hope I didn't wreck your train of thought. Well, that's a public service announcement. I don't think you're the only one. <laughs> yeah, okay. those those damn instruction manuals oh god i don't even think i have one but yeah so sorry to interrupt you no no so so my point there is just that if there is a woman who's showing up and willing to do all those things um men and women company owners middle managers own, you know big big owners little owners owe it to that person to give her the same opportunities yeah that the men are provided yeah, I agree with that. And um, and that's usually my my biggest thing is there are we we think of women as being secretaries, as being good um, thinkers and communicators, and they're really good Which at. Which women are very good at those things. Right, taking the notes in the in the meetings, or um, you know, handling the logistics, or ordering lunch, and that those things, while women are good at them, um, are also part of what pigeonholes women into, oh, well, while you were out ordering lunch for everybody, you know, we went over how to um, take off the clutch, you know, mm. cover on this tricky chainsaw. So you missed right. it. Some disregard there. 
And there's a yeah. lot of little things like that where mm -hmm. um, the women generally, and I'm generalizing here, maybe don't get the same opportunities to apprentice or learn with the really skillful uh, mentors in the company. So, yeah. And so the like, women who are, who are showing up, they, they want to do the work. Um, but a lot of times they get, they get uh, redirected, detoured into doing plant health care or planting trees or doing some more administrative things or sales. And not to say that any of those things are bad necessarily. Right. But they're bad if you didn't want to do that. Right. If that's where you were kind of uh, not forced, but like directed more towards. But yeah, if you want to get up at the tree... Yeah. And uh, do some rigging and drop some tops and, and whatever, then you should have an equal opportunity as compared to everyone else, no matter your gender, race, whatever. Like, we're all people. We all want to do it. And like you said before, I mean, obviously, there's limitations. Lots of men, mm -hmm. you know, are short or overweight or whatever it might be, not very athletic. Just They're just not good at it. They're not apt to do it. Mm -hmm. So... Um, but I mean, if they want the opportunity, they want to try, they should be given the opportunity to, to at least allow them to try too. Um, yeah, it's a tricky thing. Hey, and I think, you know, a lot of people, most people, including myself, we all like to think we're very inclusive and, oh, I would never do that and whatever. But some of these kind of, I don't know if it's beliefs or just systems built into our head from childhood is just. The world was this way. That's the world is now. The world's changing. There's, I know there's a big push for equality everywhere right now, and some things are out of control, and some are not. It's like a, it's a chaotic place. Yeah. But, <clears throat> yeah. um, that's really cool that you guys provide a bit of an entryway, I guess you would say, um, to kind of mentor up or provide some camaraderie and some yeah. community around some of those unique challenges. Because I mean, I'm not. A female. I'm uh, a six foot four male who's always been athletic, and you know what I mean. Like, I I don't even come up against a lot of those challenges. Like when I get get into yes. my biggest challenge was like, you're you're too old. You're not going to be able to do it. And I'm like, yeah, and that's here. another one. Yeah. But I mean, uh, I think you can just kind of get what you want if you if you go after it, you pursue it. But there's no need for roadblocks as far as showing up on a crew or. You know, just not giving those opportunities, like you said, to go up the tree, not giving the harness, not giving the saw, because they assume right. already that you can't hold on to it, or you have to go cut up the little stuff because you can't. Like we don't exactly. know until until you know, and it should be up to her decision not to do it. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Is there is there any tips you might have for or advice for male dominant crews, uh, leaders, or? Um, just even employees out there of how to treat a woman on a crew that may be new, mm -hmm. may be struggling, may seem uncomfortable, maybe getting picked on by others, you know, as to how to approach that without coming off as like, oh, let me hold that chainsaw for you. I'll do that. You know, like, because on one hand, I mean, if you're, if she's struggling and you're like, like, are you okay? Like, just, are you just, do you want to be candid and honest and be like, or, you know, do you want to let her suffer and wait to ask? Like, same, <laughs> same going for males, too. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, you don't want to ever make someone feel like they're incompetent. Right. So yes. what, what, do we, what do we do? I, I'm so glad that you brought that up, Kurt, because, uh, boy, it sure would be a lot easier for everyone if we would just ask, right? Hey, you look like you're struggling today. Or, hey, you've got two bags and I've got zero bags. Can I, Kurt, can I, I'll put your backpack on my back. Uh, it would just be easier for, for all of us. Uh, yeah, I think the one of the things that I've run into is there's usually a very skilled person at a company, and that person is not necessarily a good teacher. Mm. And for better or worse, the gap between delivering those skills to everybody and, and um, you know, doing it in, in a manner that is welcoming to all the learners, that's, it is what it is, right? So, uh, so I think, yeah, it's, it's good just to ask. And, um, you know, we talk about equality and being t treated equally. There are uh, some, sometimes people are ready to learn a new skill and sometimes they're not ready to learn it. Um, so I think, 
just being open and honest and upfront, like, hey, I'm going to give you, you usually know if someone's cut out for tree work within, I don't know, a couple hours even, if <laughs> when they first show up. Uh, but if, if you say to them, you know, we're going to expect you to do this book learning. You have to do the chipper safety right away. Um, we're going to sign you off on it. You have to do this book learning. Watch this video. Then I'm going to go through the chainsaw sharpening with you. We're going to go through reactive forces. Then you're going to cut so many cookies with the pushing chain, the pulling chain. We're going to do you, you're going to get the bore cut, the plunge cut. We're going to talk about ergonomics. Are you good with that? You know, follow it up. Right. Confirm and then do the practice. And one thing uh, that happens a lot, and I will, I will just say that since you asked, this is the one thing everyone can do, is don't take the work out of someone's hands when they're trying to do it. Right, which is so hard to do. So hard. I don't have a, I don't have a woman on my crew. I've had a few uh, come out and help and stuff, but not regularly. And man, it is hard it to is. Yep. let that go let people do things for you and just watch them like do it 20 times slower and like make mistakes and hit the saw into the dirt after you've told them not to do it 20 times no <laughs> but just, i mean that's how we learn yeah 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 you learn and, from your mistakes right good good thing i'm perfect you know good thing yeah. i've never tied a bowl in wrong you know you just want to give me that knot <laughs> give me that rope gosh take it out of your hands just I hurry, come on. let's go <laughs> uh but but Many people who find themselves in outdoor work and in, in our boar culture, we want to have our hands on things. And so whenever you take something away, you're taking away the opportunity to, mm. to make that jump. And, and then yeah, there's well the said. thing where, you know, the, the women or men, the people on the crew who are learning, they've got to come to the plate too. So there's plenty of YouTube videos to watch on how to tie a knot or tons of if you go to Husqvarna's website, I mean, they've got tons of information on the chainsaws and safe work practices and, you know, felling techniques. and. Yeah. Uh, Do you have any advice for women coming into the crew um, as far as how to approach this? You know, maybe they don't have, like up here we have the Prairie Chapter ISA and they got a women's yeah. thing too. And uh, I went and talked with them and it sounds wonderful, but maybe that's not an opportunity for everyone around here, depending on where you're from and you jump into a crew. I, I know I see a lot of women and other things going on where they're coming into work, and sometimes it seems like they're almost overcompensating and being a little too hardcore. Over, and it's like a, I don't know if it's a bit of a protective thing or like I'm one of the guys. Like, I mean, a lot of stuff's deep-seated in, in, in emotion or... Uh, I don't know how you describe it, but I feel like just being authentic and open with communication is probably going to solve most problems. What what would you what would you say there to someone coming in new to a female? I I agree, and um, the best the best usually people at anything are people who are authentic and also have a uh, how do I put this? You've got to have a decent sized ego to survive in tree work. I, I think that that's true. Uh, you have to have a sense of confidence as well as some skills and some, you know, some physical talent. Uh, but overinflating the ego goes way off the cliff on the other side. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, <clears throat> I think it is, it is up to the leaders, whether that leader is the middle management are going to be the top of the company or it's going to be the crew to say uh, this is a difficult thing this is an easy thing uh, do you understand what's happening in this rigging scenario do you understand right. the difference between this tree and that tree that I had you in yesterday um, can you do you see how the wood actually reacts differently in this situation mm -hmm. and that takes a really patient teacher educator, trainer, and someone who also knows that stuff, you know, from their years of experience. And so connecting those things, that's for men and women, um, but also to be realistic and say, you know, you don't learn to take down a tree or, you know, we always think felling and, and, and um, rigging is much more complicated. Also, 
getting out to the tips of branches is much more complicated. Uh, mm -hmm. Planting a tree properly is much more complicated. You have to pick those things up over periods of time. So we all need that space where we've, we've done the book learning, we can see it, we can hear it. It's our chance to do it. It's our chance to screw it up. It's our chance to do it okay. It's our chance to do it a little bit better. And then pretty soon you're good enough where you could teach it to someone else. And those things just simply take time and repetition. Yeah, yeah and that's tricky because it seems like our day-to-day -day is like how much time can we save? Go, go, go. Because there are yep. a lot of production tree companies out there. And maybe keep that in mind too like if you're working for a production tree company it's going to be you know <laughs> you don't even know what i was going to say yeah. <laughs> um sorry I'm laughing to myself here um it's going to be all out it's going to be all out sometimes yes and it may, it may not be <laughs> sorry i was searching for the word um yeah so that could be a bit tricky you you mentioned a few things a few times about trainers and you wrote this in that little questionnaire I sent you beforehand, but about trainer qualifications, good versus bad, how they take advantage. Can can you elaborate on what you were talking about there? Uh, well, it was a bit ago, but I, I think I can probably paraphrase myself. Um, yeah. It, it has to do with, and this is my opinion, is that... Um, some teachers are better than others some trainers are better than others um, you have to hit the basics and the fundamentals so you have to hit the um, you know it's like if you know you've got guardrails so you can't go over the guardrails like your kid is running into the street by the time they hit the corner they've got to know this is the stop like full stop that's our absolute line um, and so you start with those safety guardrails if you will Absolutely, right. you, you will not ever do this and then okay. fill in the blank. Um, you know, you're, you're never going to ascend the tree and not be tied in at least once. Uh, things like that. Those are our, our Bible, right? Our commandments. And there's no room for interpretation in those. And then there's the law as well. So, and there's no room for interpretation in those things. And then, besides that, after that, after you've hit those very basic things there is the you know do did you get what you need did you get what you need did you get what you need because no one is going to be at the same level in a class if you've got 10 or 12 people in a in a class you know we're gonna do aerial rescue all right let's go yeah. uh, well I don't even know how to do a two to one a three to one a four to one a five to one what's the difference what do I need you know the the um, the nuance in it which is we, you know, we, we, we train skills for certainty. So you want to have repeatable results, but you educate for reality, which is, right. I'm going to give you the picture and I'm going to give you the skills, but you're going to have to apply those skills to whatever situation you find yourself in tomorrow right. or the next day. Right. Uh, Cause each, each tool has a purpose. You need to understand how to use each tool. How to use a yep. rope, how to tie knots in it, how to put a, use a pulley, use a carabiner properly, make sure it's safe. Yep. But yeah, exactly. you don't know what situation you're going to have to use those tools in. Right. And how to be creative. But you need to know the boundaries and limitations of each tool. Right. And isn't it fun when you get to work with someone who's a creative arborist? So you're, oh, you're saying, yeah. well, here we're doing a snap cut, but we're doing it, you know, we're doing it horizontal, we're doing it vertical, we're doing it here. You know, oh, we're doing yeah. it with bigger machinery, less machinery. That stuff is fun. And yeah. Yeah. Because you, you understand the why behind it, why you're doing it. You're not just, you're not just right. cutting a notch in a hinge and back cut because you're trying to remember all the steps, which is maybe what comes in the beginning. You're so right. focused on like just getting that right. But right. ultimately, I'm probably like you, and I try and always reinforce why it's that way. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, here's a dead tree. Well, guess what? All that hinge wood we were talking about isn't really going to function the same in a dead tree so there's other things we need to consider right and they're like what i don't yeah i thought yeah, i just cut yeah. it the same way every time and you're like yeah well and then, yeah and then the beautiful thing is when someone you've been working with and mentoring comes back at you and says well rebecca 
why are you going to do it like that? Like, let's just do it this way. And you say, whoa, you're right. That's better, faster, easier. Okay, we're back. Apologies. We had some sort of issue with technical there. I don't know where he got dropped off. Hey, Rebecca. Hey there. She's back. We got her back. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know. Uh, nope. No worries. I haven't done this with anybody with a, with a phone yet, so but it seems to be working, so that's good. No worries. <laughs> Apologies just... to everyone listening. If, if, they're, if they were glued in on uh, something you were saying, I don't know really where it dropped them off, but... <laughs> I think we were talking about trainers and uh, yeah. kind of the difference between like good trainers yeah. and bad trainers. So yeah. did you have a thought still going on that or do you want me to, cause I have a bit of a question around that, but. Uh, my, my, my take home message on that is just uh, that some folks have more ego than others. And so what I would say is don't ever go to the same trainers, the same teachers, the same training company, the same mm -hmm. operations, the same <clears throat> anything. Um, right. You know, diversify your professional development because you'll get something different out of different people. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think yeah. I use that philosophy for my life is like, yeah, I love learning other people's perspectives. And yeah, and I like to view them as like, not gospel and not like always the right way yes. to do something that even though it may be, it's like, it's right for them. It's, it's what they've accumulated from all of their knowledge, from all of their experience. And they think this is the best way to do it, that they're relaying to you, but it's up to you yep. as a learner to yep. understand that that's just one piece of the puzzle. And you can learn from multiple people about different topics. And then it's up to you to combine those things and find what works best for you Absolutely. as a learner. Yeah. yeah. Well said. Um, so I was going to ask you then next, um, just to tail onto that is, do you have any tips for people that are in that position of being the trainer? Cause not everyone has had the luxury of, you know, life experience combined with going through a train, the trainer program. Right. I know with the Boer culture, Canada, it was a great course and, uh, I'm sure not everyone came out of it, you know, confident and ready to train or like a good trainer, like we're sort of labeling, but it did teach you how do you connect with people um, and that sort of thing and kind of take it more by the root. You know, if it were we yep. metaphorically talking about a tree, the root problem, and that's connecting with people, good communication, as opposed to like the prescription. Um, yes. What yeah. do you think? So yeah. if there's people out there, and I'm sure there's lots where you're, you know, maybe you've been there for a couple of months, but now you're in the position of training this brand new person on the crew. Yeah. <laughs> You mentioned patience earlier, but what, what, what would you suggest <laughs> beyond that? Right. Uh, well, I think, again, if you can, it, it, some people aren't cut out to be good teachers. And so it's okay to say no. So if you've got the skills to pay the bills and that's all you want to do, then do it. And don't make someone make you teach other people because it's not good for them and it's not good for you. Mm. Um, <clears throat> definitely I, I, my train, the trainer that I attended, um, was, uh, with, a, with a joint one with our can at, uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Up in Northern California. One of the last cool. joint operations. Joint like Nats, Arb can. Nats and Arb can. Yeah. Who was, who was teaching that? Um, was <clears throat> Tony and Dwayne and Ed. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. So, Dwayne taught and me my trainer too. Lots of other, um, Kyle was there, lot, Bob, Chainsaw Bob. There was, I mean, there were a lot of great people there. Oh, very um, cool. All that knowledge, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's everything all the time. It's all the things it's, um, you know, a good thing. I'm perfect. I'm never perfect. Uh, I hate the P word. Perfect. I hate that word. Uh, <laughs> You know, good enough is, is good enough. Good enough is good. Um, but, it, but perfect might be necessary or as close to perfect might be necessary in certain situations. So the humility, I think, to know the difference and uh, which I think goes hand in hand with the allowance that you might not know everything all the time, which goes with that ego. Um, but to be a good trainer, you really have to 
you know, you can't just rewind and hit play because uh, not everyone needs the same thing every time. And I, that's the challenge. Uh, yeah. And when you come across someone who's gifted at getting their message across, they have the ability to pause, to review, to speed up, to th take a bad idea. I, I should write a, an article on taking bad ideas and chunk them in the trash. Uh, <laughs> I think we just don't throw stuff away as quickly as we should. Um, and so that ability to adapt, so it's, it's the meta teaching. So it is, while yeah. you see me teach, um, you're going to see the skills, but you're always going to see the way that I do the skills. That's why you get the, the cool thing when you've got a protege of someone, uh, whether it's in dance or, you know, tree climb, you say, oh, I know who taught you how to climb because you, you, you climb the way they climb. Um, and, and that's the beautiful thing is all the things that you learn when you don't even know that you're learning them because mm. the way in which someone does something, you know, it's very, it's professional, it's Marlin spike, you know, it's, well, we don't do that around here, you know, and I was lucky to learn that way. I, I learned way back, uh, starting stationary single line, we called it. That's how I learned. I learned on a VT, um, to, to uh, ascend and then switch over to moving rope system. And that was a long time ago, Kurt. <laughs> uh, but I was fortunate to have really, you know, teachers who they didn't dumb it down. And uh, I wasn't allowed to use a pole saw for a long time in the tree. <laughs> you know, things like that. Like, yeah. They sent me up a pole saw. <laughs> no. <laughs> I bet you can get there. Ah. <laughs> so... Nice. So that, that whole way of being is what I'm getting at. And, and, and when you, when you get a, you know, you get a guitar teacher who they're obviously a very good guitar teacher, but they're able to translate that down to, this is the G chord. Da, da, da. Oh yeah, you got it. Or, or no, you didn't get it. And, and that really resonates with, um, with, with tree climbers, with people who are doing our board culture, because we get our hands in the dirt, you know, we got our hands in the sap, we got our hands on the saw, we got our hands on the chipper. Um, and every day is different. So you, that, that baseline and that ability to solve your own problems. I just, um, I don't think you get that unless you've been taught well. Um, yeah, there's a lot and, to unpack there. I like, yeah, you know, we said learning from, uh, being able to do it on your own and make some of those mistakes. Like a lot of us learn everything yeah. from making mistakes and if you don't make those mistakes you you know you're just following the prescription of what someone told you and then yeah, yeah I, I see it all the time when we do when we do courses and you teach it and you try and deliver it a specific way like you talk about it, the theory draw the picture then you demo right. it then they yeah. go and try and it's like okay how come <laughs> these people understand what the hell i'm saying and these people have no clue like what did i do wrong as a teacher right and it's, I guess it's, this comes with experience and I'm not saying I'm an amazing teacher, but like, I'm, I'm realizing that there's some like adaptability of like people learn differently and, and trying to find different ways to connect to like a group and make them cohesive at the same time, but then also find where people are sort of lacking in their body language and different things when they're not understanding something. And then maybe they need a little extra on the side or, yeah, you know, I don't know, it's tricky, but man, it's awesome when, when things are jiving and things are going well and everyone's on the same yeah. page yeah but i mean that could come down to the same could speak for like leadership on a crew too like doing tree jobs or whatever it might be yeah 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 that's and a that's, tricky one yeah it's a it's a beautiful thing when you get the the team working together and you know everybody does better when everybody does better so yeah to keep that vibe up do you uh, do you have yeah. a team that you work with or do you mostly individual work Oh boy, I am blessed, Kurt, to work with all sorts of um, sort of different areas of my life, different teams. Uh, and, and I think part of that comes from what you manifest and, you know, what you cultivate in your life. Um, but I get to work uh, <clears throat> with a couple great people near me, um, Paul Aline, Shelley Wollerman, um, Chris and Dave Johnson at Johnson Ops Tree Care, which is right here in the Driftless region. Uh, 
small town, but we're making the capital of arboriculture, Western Wisconsin in, nice. in the States. <laughs> uh, there's uh, Ron Zilmer who runs Legacy Tree, and he's really, the things that he's done with tree planting. Uh, I can't wait to have him on. Man, he, it's just, it's it's the stuff we all know, but why aren't we doing it? Right. Um, and yeah. he's he's taken this, yeah, he's worked with Chris and Dave Johnson. You know, you have to have the courage and you've got to have the um, cojones, right, to make that jump and <laughs> yeah. uh, just to do it and to try it and to fail and have iterations of the plantings. And um, so I've been, I'm, and, and when I worked, I worked at Bartlett when I lived in the uh, Minneapolis area and I worked with a, many great arborists, but Ryan Anderson, shout out Ryan, um, if I had had an opportunity to work more with Ryan, my my progression would have been a lot faster. Um, but you get the people who they walk the walk, and the the thing I said before, which is we don't do it like that here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we don't. It's not how we operate. And right. I've I've had the the pleasure, the privilege to be in a lot of those good operations. Um, Chad Bry was the guy who got me up into my first tree way back when he <laughs> Are these people still doing doing a lot of aboriculture? I think he is. He's up in Northern California, I think. That's cool. So you you yeah. said you uh I, I can't ignore it, but you said you manifested this kind of stuff. <laughs> and you're speaking my language a little bit there. Yeah. So I just, you know, if people don't know kind of like what you mean by that, you mm, know, so, right. some people are just, they're not there yet. Right. Um, I think I know what you mean, but how, how did you do that? How did you come across that? What do you believe in on that sense to create this reality or this world or these relationships and community around you? Yeah. Like you're, you're talking as if you're, you've created that by manifesting it. So, uh, how do you do that? Like, how do you surround <laughs> yeah, yourself boy. with these great people and find them? Uh. These are the philosophical discussions, right? <laughs> um, I think the older you get, the older one gets, or the more enlightened, whatever you want to call it, you have less time for the people and the situations that you have less time for. Mm -hmm. Meaning, I am not putting my energy into whatever right. I decide. I, I don't want to. It doesn't feel good to me. It doesn't come back to me. Um, you know, we work really hard as, as arborists and I enjoy that hard work. Um, I'm out, I mean, in your free time, a lot of times people are climbing trees in their free time. They're working out in the woods in your free time. You're cutting firewood. You're splitting it by hand. Why? Because you want to, not because you have to. Um, and those sorts of things to me are, um, they're like life itself, right? The, oh, it's, it's gritty. It's harder, but or it puts me out, but I'm going to do this because this person is important to me. You know, this project is important to me. Or the way I walk through uh, my professional career is important to me. And those hard lines, those hard guardrails, um, they make the job easier. And so when you're working with someone who says, wow, we could um, take this shortcut, um, but it'll look worse. Then you say, well, let's not take that shortcut and it'll look better when we leave. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of gray areas in there, but mm -hmm. if you continually hold everyone to a higher standard, what's going to happen is it'll come back around and they'll hold you to the higher standard later. You know, when you, when you get tired, um, and everything is like that. Um, you're doing what you think is right in those situations. It sounds like you're kind of, um, I guess, living your truth in that sense. You know, when you make a cut or you do something, yeah, and you know you can take a short because I've been there lots, right? And you're just like, yeah. oh, the homeowner won't know. I can just get this job done way faster if I just take off right. this whole limb instead of messing around with pruning this and that. They're attached to it and this and, you know. Yeah. But in your gut, I guess, you're like, something's telling you, no, you're kind of cheating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so I guess if you live by that sort of law that you want to do everything that's right, you know, inside of you. Yeah. 
because no one's policing you. No one's going to come over there and say, hey, you shouldn't have done that. Uh, no one right? polices you. Like it's, you. it's having yeah. that integrity yeah. to do it and yeah. do its right and, and having like respect for the, for the trees. I mean, do you, do you believe that? I think you do, but um, with your name of Tree Spirit Consulting, but yeah, uh, how should I word this? But um, what do you think like the importance of, of trees are in that sense, like, or what would you like to change if you could in a Bora culture, if you could have a magic wand to everyone in a Bora culture and how we approach a Bora culture right now with considerations of trees and what we believe that they're living things. Uh, do you think that's important and how, or do you think that should alter how we kind of do things? Who, uh, yeah, my, my biggest, Magic wand. Ooh, could I have two magic wands? <laughs> sure, you could have two. I have the power to give out magic wands. That's ultimate cool. power. <laughs> uh, I'd like to see a lot more live and let live. Kind of a lot of more deadwood trees falling over when they're not. We don't absolutely need to take them out. Uh, I know that's not practical, um, but I also know that we're pretty remarkable engineers, and so we could. If we have a different way of thinking, we could allow mm -hmm. that to happen more. Yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of, this is a whole other philosophical thing, but it's the way you live is the way you die is that, you know, we all go there and uh, acceptance is better than fighting a lot of things. Again, that's another philosophical thing. Going um, with the flow a bit. <clears throat> yeah. Just, just recognizing that we get the life, yeah. right? It's a yeah. short time, really. Um, trees get more than we do, maybe two or three or four times as much. Um, so allowing things to happen. Um, what? Yeah. What do you mean by like allowing things to happen? Like I know, like we're the first, we're the front line, and we're the last line for a lot of these trees in the yeah. urban environment. Usually, right? We're we're the ones that could be or should be educating the homeowners, the people that you know technically own these trees. Right. As to why we're doing what we're doing or why we're not doing something. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sort of losing track of what I uh, was going to ask, but I guess what do you think is our responsibility in that sense? Like, do you think we should change our approach like towards the trees as far as how much work we do like i when you said like maybe leaving some dead wood and these sort of other considerations that are not just usual i, f I feel yeah. like i find myself in this situation a lot now like the, the greater i appreciate trees and their connection and how it relates to the environment and how they you know they have their own unique consciousness you know i'm not like tree hugging like oh don't cut the tree it's got feelings like whatever but i mean i am appreciating things for how they are right and times are most valuable resource we run out of time in life like you were saying um you know you really appreciate the moment and what you're doing matters so i find myself talking myself out of doing a lot of tree work you know mm -hmm. like the more i know and the more i appreciate this the less i'm doing i'm like you don't even need to prune the tree right. like really we can wait right. two years I right. get to talk myself out of business constantly with that mindset and how do we balance yeah. business, but also be advocates for trees. Yeah. Well, I think you said it, which is do no harm. The first thing, you know, um, do you have to manage this? Is it, does it need to be highly managed or does nature already have a whole thing in place about how to take care of that? Um, yeah. But which, right. We live in more the often than we know it, 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 it yeah. may. Yeah, but we live in the real world. So <clears throat> for me, I'd like to see people um, set aside bigger chunks instead of having our little, you know, our little front lawn with the linden installed psh, and the landscapers say, install it psh, like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Drop so it I'd in, like to, skidster. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to see bigger chunks, I guess. Bigger chunks of land, of prairies, of woods, of water of buffers on water um because <clears throat> i think it's more acceptable to people than to 
say, oh, you can't prune any deadwood out of your tree. Well, that's just crazy because it's over the sidewalk. Well, if we didn't have a sidewalk there, then we could have a different conversation. Right. So it's, it's expanding your, it's expanding everybody's landscape architects, landscape designers, homeowners. Um, <clears throat> and so more of that live and let live. Um, yeah. Expand their imagine. perspective beyond, beyond just like the, I'm arborist to do work. They're either want pruning or they want removing, which yeah. one's it going to be, uh, <laughs> you know, Oh, I'm just going to choose removal because it's easier for me and my guys right. to do it and faster and I make more money. But, right. uh, yeah, yeah. It's tricky because when you look at it from a greater perspective with those things and removing, like you said, certain limbs or a tree that's not grown properly and it's big co-dominant and this and that, like, yeah, like hopefully you have something in your wheelhouse to maybe correct that or take a yeah. chance. Like, of course there's risk. There's risk in so many things, but I feel like we're always trying to alleviate every possibility of risk out there like how many times do you yeah. get i don't know if you still do but get calls for like my tree's just too big like it's <laughs> gonna fall and break something it's like well it's possible i mean your house is within the landing zone of this tree right. but like it's been there for 35 years or whatever and it's yeah, yeah. looks healthy uh, why would we assume it's gonna <sighs> break all of a sudden and you, you're like well i can't guarantee it i mean someone's tree did break right you know, across town, but like, it's not the right thing to do just to mow your tree down because of that. No, no. I, and it's, it's difficult because nature still is unpredictable. So yeah, still, still, there is always the risk. So right. Living, being comfortable with the level of risk. Um, and, and it, accepting the decline too, you know, we were declining, we died, accepting that as part of a bigger picture, bigger process. Um, yeah. A second magic wand would be kind of what you're doing, which is... <laughs> I forgot you still had one. Yeah. <laughs> 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 would be, uh, you know, mass plantings um, to in those spots where we could, where we could restore. Um, big prairies, big chunks of wetland, big... You know, restore. I love the taking out dams in the Pacific Northwest. Man, that just fills my heart with joy. Uh, and uh, just big tracts of land, bigger <clears throat> tracts of land, so that nature has some ability to repair and restore. Yeah, and I mean, we don't have, we can't add more land on to right. uh, what we have. I mean, we can expand into more harsher environments, I guess, but. We either have to use a lot of the land that we have that's being mismanaged or I don't know what. There's lots of different probably creative ideas out there to utilize that. But Right. Yeah, I love the idea of, of uh, bigger plantings and stuff too and then allowing nature to kind of get that momentum and be able to look after itself and right. create right. a diverse ecosystem again. Yeah. Yep. It's interesting. Um, okay, so I have a question based for like one more topic if you're okay with that. Yeah, let's go. We could go yeah. down a little bit just about, um, you know, you mentioned some decline there, like decline being natural in trees. Mm -hmm. And I've been wanting to ask experts kind of their thoughts on like insects and diseases and their role in tree care. Because I know from my earlier perspective and what they generally teach is we all look at trees as being that's that's our focus, right? But trees are attached to greater things like what right. the pests or what we label as pests eat right and like they have to exist too it's all you know lion king circle of life whatever it's all tied together and we are the ones that label it as being negative so how do you manage insects and diseases and educate your clients around that when they're calling because their tree is infested with aphids and there's wasps and it's happening year after year and maybe they're doing things right with the soil and whatever, but you know, where do you draw the line? Where do you allow things yeah. to be? You know what uh, I mean? It's, it's a tough one. It is. Uh, I, I think that this is, I think that this is one of the biggest problems that we have as humans is that we don't do that live and let live that, uh, you know, there's a, a stinging nettle in your yard. Oh, we have to eliminate it because I got, you know, stung on my hand. I, the burn weed. 
they call it people call it burnweed, call it stinging nettle. Whereas burn some weed. people will Burns. eat it. You know, you harvest it, you forage it, you cook it down. It's delicious. And some people want to eliminate it um, because it pokes, you know, it leaves a little irritation on your hand. And it's like, we got to toughen up. I mean, it's not that bad. A um, couple of nights ago, I was, I got to get a shovel out of our lean-to to do some work. And I went in there and I was rummaging around and... Um, after about 15 seconds, then I discovered the little hornet's nest or they discovered me right. and I, you know, I stepped back and it was all good, but then I made my calculated risk decision to go back in there because I really still needed the shovel. Um, and one came down and flew right into my middle of my head and stung me right in the middle of my head, forehead, oh, geez. right there. And, and I was reminded that, you know, that's how they defend their nest. Um, but I was not happy. Um, I adjusted and then I had a choice. I could have um, done nothing. I could have gotten the big can of spray out. Um, but what I did is I came back at night and I just had a, it wasn't big. And I just grabbed it with a paper towel and, you know, relocated them. Right. Um, I think we just, like humans, we get used to these weird artificial scents and we, we don't, we don't realize that decay is natural. You go out into the woods, you break apart a log. It smells like the earth. It's got critters in it. It's got multiple life cycles. Uh, and it doesn't like still skin off my teeth. If I get it dirty or if I get stung, mm -hmm. um, to, to some extent. So I think yeah. we just need to toughen up and, and live and let live that grace of other organisms and, uh, yeah. You know, one thing that bugs me a lot is when people use um, the rodenticides to, to take care of mice and uh, rats or voles. And, you know, that goes right up the food chain and it ends up killing internal bleeding to death of raptors and owls. And these are, I mean, we have no business doing that. Foxes and skunks, like they need to eat too. <laughs> uh, so that, yeah, that grace. that's a tricky one. I would like us to have some grace for all things. Yeah, I think about that a lot. We get a lot of complaints too about voles and different things and these yeah. critters and, you know, or ants. People are always trying to kill ants all the time. Yeah. I mean, I don't know a lot about ants. It's, they seem some sort of unusually intelligent, crazy colonies and this and that. And they're not really interfering or doing anything bad. No. But but why are we killing all of them? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think they're crawling around and stuff. I mean, it's just the way it is. <laughs> Yeah, but we don't we don't own like the world. It's not like ours to like just control how we want. I right. think that's a perspective shift. Yes. But do you think yeah. how much insect and disease do you allow to come into the trees that you look after for for your customers and things like that? Mm -hmm. um, do you judge their tolerance level and try and yeah. work with them? And, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And explain it's... like, sorry, go ahead. No, I think it is more about their tolerance level. Um, and, and like a lot of arborists, the integrated pest management trying to target that timing. So around here, apple scab is a big, um, it's ornamental crab apples and it's, it just makes them look terrible. Um, but if you do the timing of the apple scab fungicide sprays properly, then you can use less and usually get pretty good control on it. And unless you're at the capital grounds. You know, you don't need to get 100% control. You just need to get pretty good control. So adjusting those expectations um, and then and doing those targeted applications. Right. Do you find yourself ever in a place when you're discussing types of tree work with your client? Uh, like you said, in that case, you would go with the tolerance of your client. But there, do you have a moral boundary in this? So I've experienced this myself too, where it's like as an arborist, you're offering your insight and expertise and perspective. Maybe you're giving a prescription for pruning or what you would do or not do. And the client wants something else or they want you to be like a yes man for lack of a better uh, term, yeah. a yes person. Yeah. Um, do you tolerate that? Do you, how do you navigate that? Do you just say, you know, find someone else? I got, 
I'm not going to even bother. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's tough because when you're in business too, you, you need to do a percentage of plant health care, pruning, removals, um, planting, cons- consultation, construction damage. Um, I, I don't do this much anymore, but, um, I think you, I think you have to do some of the plant health care because it's the reason, but I do feel I've got a decent platform to try and convince people. Like I don't want to inject this ash tree, um, at all or in perpetuity or this elm tree. Um, can we also plant another tree to take over for it? Um, right. so let's do Some this alternative now. Solutions. Yeah, let's do this now. And then let's look towards the future, the near future, the far distant future. I once had someone say to me, Oh, you arborist, you're always looking, you're always thinking so long term. <laughs> <laughs> like that. It took 20 years for a tree to get like this. Now you want me to fix it overnight. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. One last question. It's sort of related sure. to the, the disease and uh, somebody I had had a conversation with recently at the uh, ISA Prairie Climate Competition. We were talking about mulch because I'm a big advocate for, I would love to find uh, or maybe educate or op- offer some ideas around reusing our mulch as arborists as much as we can. I mean, it's pretty obvious, yeah. but if we could do this a little more organized, a little more purposeful, um, I personally want to have a mulch drop maybe in our community, for other, bring other arborists and do that and yeah. then allow like the citizens to come and get the mulch and use it as they wish and get it back into the community, that sort of thing. And, you know, he brought up a good point about uh, like diseases in the tree, like when they're infected and whatever, because a lot of the trees that we take down are all mixed in with different spores and this and that. And I'm like, yeah, I know I get it. And I wonder about that myself. I asked yeah. in some arboriculture courses and people were kind of like, ah, oh, no, it doesn't matter. Once it goes through the chipper, it's fine. Nothing's going to happen. But I'm like, but I'm like, but these are spores, like spores just fly through the air. Like maybe it won't last a long time in the mulch. Like it will die off or go dormant or whatever, because it's not attached to any more live tissue, that sort of thing. But is there a risk there, you know, spreading that mulch around in the back into the community and putting it under trees or does it just exist everywhere anyways? And the whole problem is that your trees is not healthy and it's vulnerable and it's going to get what it's going to get. Like, do you think there's a yeah. way we can manage that or is, is that a risk or a problem? Ooh, uh, this might be for some people smarter than I am. Uh, I do know that how it's handled does matter because, um, for, for instance, Emerald Ash Borer, if the chips are less than one inch by one inch. So pretty small, Mm -hmm. um, that there's less to no chance of the larva being able to survive in a wet piece of, of bark and, and live tissue, uh, because it dries out too quickly. So, so physical size matters of chips. And then, uh, I mentioned Johnson ops, the David, Dave and Chris owning, um, near me, they've got a, a, a tub grinder and then they, process that again. So that kind of mulch, that's what I use, uh, here at my house and it's beautiful. It smells great. It's, it's essentially, it's a double grind. Oh, um, interesting. But it's, it's, it requires a tub grinder. So that's a, you know, you gotta have, you gotta jump. Um, and that's what I mean is we've got the technology. We know how to do it. So, um, but it, there's a cost to it. So what do we do? Do we value? Um, and then the way they treat that is a lot of, in a lot of places, you've got a huge pile. So the heat, anything that you're composting goes up to a certain temperature. And then that should, in theory, kill things like verticillium wilt and other the fungal diseases. Um, right. I but, always find those treatments yeah. so, you know, I don't know. It's like taking antibiotics. You know, you got, you got something bad in your gut. So you take antibiotics and you nuke everything, but there's so many beneficials too, right? right? And then we have to go back and replace and eat probiotics or wait for it to balance out again, naturally and organically. But, and kind of same with trees, like I get it, like with mulch, we could like nuke it and, yeah. you know, hot compost it essentially and kill everything to stop the spread. But I guess now we're just left with organic matter and we don't have an, that 
benefit of uh, it being like aged mulch and inoculant of these microbes oh yeah and fungi I see to get that. back yeah that's a great I don't know question how to, yeah and i don't know if the good ones will compete the bad ones if it's managed properly or or what these are those things i wonder they don't keep me up at night but i mean they might wake me up early once in a while <laughs> <laughs> i wonder uh boy yes i bet there's some research out there on we got to find uh, that person. I know Glenn Percival at the Bartlett Research Lab in uh, in England, in the UK, oh, was yeah. doing some cool work with um, biochar and adding chitin or different things to the, um, basically the soil amendments that, that Bartlett was doing. But, hmm. and of course, compost tea and all that, but. Right. That's some interesting, interested. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really interested in that road as well. To regrow our beneficials and the micro flora and fauna in the yeah. I mean yeah, if I go out back my... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. You go back you go you go back out into the woods and I've got yeah. if I kick apart a, a decaying log, it's, psh, it's a lot of stuff in there. Yeah. It takes time. And it's sort of like my belief, uh I feel it's the right thing is that like nature's smart it's uh intelligence is going to self-balance all the time and uh i like to tell people mimic nature that's kind of like my hashtag that i like to use yeah. what i can is mimic nature yeah. when you're trying to do something and uh i know like herbicides in soil if they could be persistent and last for years and years and years but if it's inoculated with a healthy mix of like compost that's alive with organisms mm -hmm. and allowed to be mm -hmm. in the right moisture levels like it will it will consume and convert all these herbicides over like within like a year or something. Like it just, yeah. things just get better and correct with the right amount of life in there. And I always try and encourage that, but yeah. I don't know. I'm not a, whatever you call it, fungologist, well, entomologist. <laughs> but, <laughs> to really but there's get something the there. The um, mushrooms have been used in the, the brown fields too. The EPA, you know, the, the terrible in the uh, plastic. sites. Yeah. To try oh, yeah. For like some reclamation and uh, yeah, bioremediation. So yeah, I mean the small stuff is powerful. Um, yeah. Maybe have to talk to Bartlett guy one day. Yeah. <laughs> it's like if you ever think to yourself, what would I do if I had a, a couple other lifetimes? Would I be? Yeah. I yeah. might be an architect. I like good design. It'd be fun. Yeah. I might be a horse trainer. That'd be fun. Well, it could be part of my life. I'm gonna. I might go down those roads a little bit more, at least to make them uh, applicable to a boar culture in some yeah. ways that we we practice yeah. and get into things. So, yeah, that's on the that's on the radar. Which actually, what I want to loop back with you at some point after the podcast, maybe around uh, some educational type things that you say you talk about developing curriculums and those different things like that. Yeah, I got some. I got some yeah. big ideas of something fairly specific that I want to do, um, but I don't have any background in making a curriculum <laughs> but it's going to fall under the atmos tree umbrella you can manifest that stuff manifest i could just surround yourself with the people who energize you and yeah well i mean i did here you are yeah there are ways <laughs> we've right. got people You're Tree people piece. are oh, big-hearted good energy yeah yeah it's awesome yeah it well is. thank you very much um, for oh, coming you're on welcome, the podcast. Yeah, was, there, I, was there anything else you wanted to say or anything? Or are you, you good there? Or? I think I'm good. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, Hopefully do it again sometime. Maybe yeah, in person. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that would be great. That would be awesome. I would love to connect with you down there. I'm sure it will happen at one point. I think my future is going to be some traveling with uh, Atmos Tree, maybe to some different conferences and different things to get out there. And Sweet. ultimately I want to position myself into a place where I can do a, like a one hour and a one day type course based on, you know, something I was referring to there, like a, a bit of an online thing integrated as well, but kind of like through my eyes and what I've learned through uh, combining some permaculture and living soil systems and whatever, and that kind of thing. Yeah. I don't want to say too much. Someone's going to steal my idea. I like it. <laughs> anyway. Sign me up. Sounds good. Yeah, like yeah. Um, okay, so people can find you at Tree Spirit Consulting on Instagram, right. correct? Right, on and Instagram and 
and YouTube as well. YouTube? You have yep. a bunch of videos on there. It looks like all sorts of different stuff, tying knots, Little, yeah. whatever, lots of, yeah. Yeah, that started organically, trying to get people to do the homework on their knots. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, might as well. You're like, I'm just going to put this online. Yeah. Um, treespiritconsulting.com uh, yep. is your website in progress, like the rest of us. Yes. Uh, it looks pretty good, but I know what you mean. Um, yeah, people can find you there, training, all that kind of stuff. Great. Well, this is yep. awesome. Thanks again. Um, I'm sure it's going to work. I'm going to press stop recording and then don't hang up okay. yet, okay? Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Kurt. No problem.